Hello and good morning from Ecologic Institute in Berlin. Um, my name is Arne Riedel and I have the pleasure to guide you through today's workshop. Uh, let's listen to the Arctic Ocean. Um, we have um, an exciting roster of uh, speakers today to celebrate with you the last day of our week of listening to the Arctic Ocean. For those of you who already participated in one or several of our events on Tuesday, welcome back. It's great to see you again and thanks again for all your contributions. For those of you who are just joining for the first time, no worries, I'll try to get you up to speed in no time. So um, for those of you who haven't been part of that exchange so far, we have had uh, an exciting um, three sessions on Tuesday, um, giving an overview on what the EU for Ocean Coalition does, what the platform is providing for different organizations and networks and uh, individuals, but also diving deeper uh, with our teacher workshop and also with our youth workshop into the different communities contributing to EU for Ocean's work. So that's been an exciting day, three events, almost six hours of content where we were discussing with experts who are working on EU um, for Ocean, but also Arctic Ocean literacy more generally. So we've heard voices from Greenland sharing insights uh, from their uh, communities and their um, impacted regions, um, but also heard uh, from teachers what they would really like to see in the future and also from our podcast panelists um, and in the opening session um, about our If Oceans Could Speak podcast and what insights they gained. So we will dive a little bit deeper into the outcomes of the session later today. And what I would like to share is, of course, in the this week has been very active in, in all terms. Um, so we've seen um, last week already the Arctic Science Summit Week taking place, the Arctic Observing Summit, and uh, the midweek um, we've had the High North Dialogue. So many Arctic events um, evolving around also this week. And so we hope that uh, you will listen to the Arctic Ocean, not just this week, but also in the upcoming weeks. And towards the end of the workshop, I would like to share some uh, sort of next steps and next meetings where you can learn more about Arctic Ocean Literacy, where you can meet us and the presenters uh, from the project, hopefully in person at some point as well. Having said all this, um, it's been an uh, exciting week also um, because we see the urgency uh, that climate change is, um, how climate change is impacting uh, the whole world and the whole climate, the oceans and the Arctic in particular. So the IPCC uh, report released on Monday shows us again that thresholds and tipping points are reached much quicker than ever before, that uh, the 1.5 degree target under the Paris Agreement uh, needs immediate action and urgent action right now, and that it's already um, running away, the time is running away for us to become active. So what can we do in this? And before we dive into the program, um, I want to reflect a little bit on the insights on Arctic Ocean literacy that we've gained so far. <clears throat> there is, of course, what I mentioned in the opening session, um, a split between people living in the Arctic and those of us in non-Arctic countries. And uh, I'll make that statement again. I'm here in Berlin, in Germany, and you might wonder what I have to do with the Arctic. But indeed, working on Arctic governance requires us to listen to the inhabitants, the indigenous rights holders, the communities in the Arctic to really make a difference and show the respect for their knowledge, their traditions and their livelihoods. So this is really just me and also uh, I would say all of us from the non-Arctic countries trying to give more insights but also share the respect and the, um, for the people and the knowledge um, that exists in the Arctic. So that's, I think, what we want to reflect on today, share a bit of more of the insights that we gained on Tuesday, and also then listen um, to you and also ask you some questions and um, hear um, from you what you would like to know more or where you would require more information in the future. So we'll discuss the outcomes and then also look towards synergies. How can we merge these uh, different insights 
that we have received so far. With that, I think I've talked long enough. You'll hear more from me later. But uh, I would like to introduce you to Paul Rose, uh, explorer and uh, expedition leader, an experienced Arctic Ocean diver um, who prefers dry suits to wetsuits. I think that's what we've established <laughs> so far uh, when now. it comes to colder waters. And uh, Paul is so kind to um, share uh, the insights uh, into the Arctic Ocean from his uh, long running career working in the polar regions and uh, exploring them and also sharing knowledge um, to a wider audience. It's my pleasure to welcome you, Paul, and uh, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thanks, Arne. And hello, everybody. It's great to be here. I only wish we were together in person. You know, these events are so good and we've all become great at the virtual events, but wow, there's nothing that can be us all being together. So I'm sorry we're not all physically together in a glorious uh, venue or even better, standing on an Arctic beach or on an ice cap or on a previously unclimbed mountain or previously untraveled route or somewhere uh, north of 60. Wouldn't that be great uh, right now? But for me, the Arctic has always had a sense of the place to tell powerful stories. And as a young man, not knowing anything about exploration at all, and certainly nothing about the Arctic, it was the stories of Fritjof Nansen. You know, his Fram expedition, 1893, 1896, it was him that got me excited. He got me excited enough to start a career that I call science support, which is, you know, I'm no scientist, but I understand science, I have an affinity to it, so I can meet people like you, scientists with big ideas, complex, ambitious, risky hypotheses, and turn that idea into something that's gonna work in the cold places. You know, icebreakers, helicopters, ships, uh, technical field staff and camps of all kinds. Um, so that's what I do for a living. And it was Nansen that got me inspired, that journey, and particularly when him and Johansson uh, didn't make the North Pole, as we all know, and had that enforced uh, winter on Jackson Island. And very fortunately, some years later, um, here I was, it'd be five years ago now, where I was ashore at Jackson Island, almost on a pilgrimage, I suppose, uh, part of our expedition. The conditions were terrible. We couldn't land the Zodiacs. So the uh, our icebreaker skipper uh, that we were based our science work on said that we could swim ashore. So three of us uh, put our dry suits on, as Arne said, and you know, managed to swim ashore and be at that place where Johansson and Nansen had that amazing winter and the story that we all know. And actually physically standing there reinforced that moment of like, yes, this is the place to tell great stories. Nansen himself said that all the best ideas come from the wild places. And because the Arctic is so close, and let's face it, most of us do live in the Northern Hemisphere, it's relatively easy to get to compared to say the Antarctic, it is the perfect place for us to work and bring home important science data told by compelling stories. And people have that glow in their eyes. You know yourself, when you, when you walk in someone's office and they've just come back from an amazing adventure, they look different, don't they? Even if it's just a, a really fantastic lunchtime bike ride or a lunchtime run or a lunchtime swim. But when people have come back from a big trip, they have a look about them. And it's that look that carries our messages in such a powerful way to decision makers, politicians, business leaders, educators. So I have a dream of getting business leaders, politicians, educators up to the Arctic. And in front of them is all of our young people, which is why I'm such a big fan, a big supporter of the youth programs that work in the Arctic. It's a wonderful way. That's where we want the young ones to form their ideas and set of values. Um, and with everything that's going on, as Anna says, you know, we, we know we're not going to make the one and a half degrees uh, that was previously agreed. We have all these wonderful agreements, the COP, the COP programs. You know, we just had COP26 here in England earlier this year, the Paris Agreement, the UN Decade of Actions, the It Best Report, the Euro beautiful European Green Deal. But I feel we're at a very delicate balance moment because we're almost getting used to not making those targets. Um, we normally use the term shifting baselines in regards to science uh, and conservation matters where uh, each generation expects less and less from the previous generation. But I wonder if we shouldn't start thinking of 
the term shifting baselines for the way we look at international agreements. These are legally binding. Um, we need Arne there as our lawyer. We need legally binding international agreements. And yet we've almost become used to not making those targets. It's crazy. And, and of course, most of us, I'm sure you have all seen that film, Don't Look Up. We're at that don't look up moment. You know, we're, we're all bringing this news. We're telling everybody we can. And yet not much is happening. We're really not feeling and sensing the change. So the way to get that change, I think, and I'm biased here because I love the Arctic so much and I love working up there so much, is to tell stories from the Arctic. Let's get the young ones up there as early in their education as possible. I think about the school curricula. Um, you know, the European school curricula hasn't changed very much. I mean, we've got some outdoor education shining examples uh, in great places in Europe, but, but how is it that we can't have a school curricula that adjusts and adapts to current affairs? So in other words, when COP26 was on, I was appalled that in Britain, every single school wasn't focused on a COP26 theme, maybe the month before the weeks of COP and the month after or when the Paris Agreement was signed. Why aren't global schools focused on the Paris Agreement? You still do all your lessons, but somehow it has that theme running through it. And why don't we have Arctic themed weeks in schools that are sort of mandatory uh, legal, in, uh, legal uh, agreements that we must do that kind of schooling. So this is the kind of language we need. We need to break through it so that every single action we do has a sense of we're getting somewhere with these international agreements. And I feel the Arctic is the place to tell that story. And it's also the place to help us break through this weird moment of opportunity that we have with COVID. Uh, when COVID arrived a couple of years ago, people like me, we sort of celebrated in a way that at last we knew that we were out of balance with nature. And that's what caused COVID to arrive in our lives. And there was a sense that at last people are saying, okay, science has brought the vaccine, but the only true vaccine against future pandemics is to readdress that balance. And how do we do that? Well, we protect what we have, restore what's been damaged and reset our values so it doesn't happen again. Well, how do we do that? I feel there's an opportunity slowly missing now and we need to capture this golden moment. And I think the way to do that is to get people excited and motivated and emotionally engaged with the Arctic. It's the best way to get engaged with anything. And the launch for that is right here, the EU for Ocean Arctic Liter Literacy event. I'm hoping that this event right here is the sort of Fritjof Nansen moment for a lot of people to say, right, let's get engaged with the Arctic and let's begin to make a difference. So there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul, for the inspiring words. and no pressure at all on us uh, to be a Fridge of Nansen moment for others. Uh, exactly. Thanks for, for making that connection. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, with those overview words, uh, I would like to uh, dive with you a little deeper into the content and the outcomes of our discussions that we had on Tuesday. So um, for those of you who have been present in all three events, you might hear some, uh, hopefully some familiar words, uh, but I think not all of you have been able to join to all of those events. So uh, bear with me while we try to give you uh, a bit of context, um, a bit of overview of what we discussed, uh, but also on the outcomes and ideas that we take from these different sessions. So um, with that, um, I... Uh, will give you a little bit of an overview myself on the opening session. And um, I think we, we had um, a three-way uh, split I would like to report back on. So the first part being um, our uh, welcoming words and setting the scene by our EU Arctic uh, ambassador, Michael Mann, and our colleague, Jose Miguel from uh, DG Mare, providing the framework under which the EU operates and works in the Arctic. Um, so Michael described um, in detail, um, uh, in more detail, the um, development of the EU Arctic strategy, and I think making a very a strong point that the EU is in the Arctic, um, that there is a cooperation that the EU can bring um, while respecting, of course, um, the um, 
yeah, sovereign uh, Arctic states uh, and their work in the Arctic ongoing. Um, Michael uh, and, and uh, Jose Miguel also um, put a very um, strong case forward saying that, uh, that very recently the cooperation in the Arctic region has been severely impacted by the Russian Federation's aggressions against Ukraine. And so that the Arctic Council suspended its meetings and work until further notice. And also uh, lots of Arctic research with Russian partners uh, has been halted uh, and or grinded to a halt. So I think what we are taking away from this is how does a networking event that you know, is, cannot include 40% of the Arctic Ocean coastline, how, how can we uh, deal with this issue? I think that is, that is indeed a more challenging time than ever for Arctic cooperation. And um, the Arctic Council has been a very powerful uh, voice in the past and bringing together experts uh, from the circumpolar regions to work on substantial um, landmark um, achievements um, in, you know, on permafrost, on uh, sea ice, on conservation of biodiversity, and uh, monitoring uh, shipping assessments, etc. So, how do we deal with this in the future? I think there's a, um, an, a way that Arctic Ocean Literacy Exchange can contribute to that um, um, exchange and trying to build bridges to all of those still doing research in the Arctic. Um, so how that will work in practice remains to be seen. That's a little too early uh, with the ongoing conflict uh, to say, but definitely I think the EU uh, is interested in, in, in going um, the extra mile to make sure that the cooperation and knowledge exchange continues with the uh, other Arctic uh, coastal states and that we sort of try to compensate for the things that it might be lacking. So cooperation in the Arctic at this urgent um, and immediate pressing time is more important than ever. Um, so just to give you um, an overview of what we discussed at the guiding part uh, at our opening session. There were two more parts in our opening session and I'll try to touch briefly on them as well. Um, the second part um, was meant to give you an overview on what the EU Ocean platform does and how different EU Ocean platform members are working towards Arctic Ocean literacy. And in that, we had a great roster of experts uh, ranging from Paula Kakampe from the Finnish Environment Institute, uh, Timon Zielinski uh, from IOPAN. Um, we had uh, Michael Karcher from uh, Alfred Wegener Institute, and we had um, Anna Marino from our Youth for Ocean Forum. And they provided very different insights. Um, I would start with a brief insight into what we heard from, from Paula and from Timon and sharing um, that the EU Ocean, for, uh, EU for Ocean platform is working in different working groups, climate and ocean, food from the ocean and a healthy and clean ocean, um, showing what needs to be tackled and what needs to be addressed. So Paula focused more uh, a bit on the on the Finnish perspective of an EU Arctic state, while Timon was able from Poland to give us an insight into um, research also being done on Arctic Ocean literacy in a non-Arctic state. And I think what what um, struck me the most uh, was also in his presentation that um, while we are doing or trying to do a lot more uh, on Arctic Ocean literacy, there is indeed still very lot to do, a uh, lot to do and very much to achieve. Um, I think there was one slide which um, left the imprint on me where he looked at um, the connotations, what people relate to the, uh, connect with the Arctic when they, when they hear about this. And simple questions with like, you know, if polar bears and, and penguins would be able to meet, um, that there is still like a lot of, of knowledge uh, in sort of a basic understanding uh, keeping the Arctic and the Antarctic apart and understanding the different um, regions better, understanding the different needs, and of course also understanding what I mentioned in the beginning, that the Arctic is an inhabited place with many people working, uh, living, and um, yeah, having been there for uh, thousands of years. So I think that just goes um, that the EU for Ocean platform can contribute to 
close that knowledge gap further, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. That is one surely and one takeaway uh, from our two panelists there. In the second step, we had a look into what EU for Ocean um, coalition members are doing, and we heard from the Alfred Degner Institute, there's a big EU project called ArcticPassion.eu. It's about observation, observational systems in the Arctic, but also working together with Arctic communities to work towards a better and improved understanding uh, of the Arctic and its climate. So ArcticPassion.eu, uh, that's where you can find additional information. And um, Michael Carter was also so kind to share some insights from um, the Mosaic expedition where a research icebreaker, the Polarstern, was um, drifting uh, on an ice float while conducting several hundred scientists, um, a lot of experiments in all terms of um, uh, scientific areas and fields ranging from uh, looking at sea ice, looking at habitats, looking at um, ocean physics, but also of course atmospheric uh, developments, um, taking samples and probes. So there was a lot of input already, and they also produced a documentary actually, um, which, uh, which is um, um, hopefully available uh, soon uh, to a wider audience. And um, also lots of teaching materials were produced in that. So the um, Mosaic expedition also doing a lot of outreach and exchange showing how Arctic Ocean literacy can be derived from ongoing research projects and what's really needed to get the message out there. And our panel closed on Tuesday with Anna um, talking about the Youth for Ocean, but Anna will be presenting a bit on the Youth for Ocean workshop herself in a bit, so I'm not gonna take that away, uh, of course. And to close my overview and, and lessons learned, we discussed with our podcast panel. And those of you uh, who have heard me speak about Arctic Ocean literacy, I probably mentioned in every second sentence, is our uh, podcast that is a direct spin-off from our exchange with colleagues uh, on EU for Ocean. Um, the podcast is called If Oceans Could Speak, and its first season with the eight episodes focuses entirely on Arctic Ocean literacy. So I had the honor and pleasure really to talk with our colleagues um, from the, who made the podcast possible, uh, Penny Clark, uh, Hannah Kubains, um, Jen Freer, and uh, Stefan Kirchner, um, two of them being the hosts, Stefan and Jen, uh, Penny being the organizer, and uh, Hannah being one of our guests uh, at the podcast, uh, talking about spotting whales from space. So just with that, we, we dive, yeah, we're diving in deeper a little bit into what the podcast's approach is and was, meaning a conversational style exchange, um, bringing down the barrier of entry to Arctic knowledge, by also including a wide variety of different speakers. So having um, musician composers, uh, having the captain of the Polarstern and icebreaker, um, having um, researchers working on satellite images, as I mentioned, spotting whales from space, um, going to uh, indigenous Arctic uh, biodiversity experts uh, working in Greenland. So providing perspectives on things that aren't the usual thing you might think of when you hear about the Arctic and creating that emotional connection and that curiosity, I would say, that kind of space. So we talked a bit about this and also asked the audience members what would they like to receive more in terms of Arctic Ocean literacy materials. Of course, seeing that this is not a representative poll, um, we had uh, several people, of course, um, having different opinions, but I think there was an emerging trend. Uh, again, it's an anecdotal evidence, not a scientific poll, but just from the participants who joined that poll in our Tuesday morning session, um, the need for more teaching materials, the interest in documentaries and movies. So I would say things that are prepared, things that are easy to access and easy to distribute, and uh, also more information on social media, uh, where probably most of us spend too much time on anyway. So we might as well do this on a, for a good cause and with, a, with our best intentions. So um, those were some feedbacks also from the audience where they would like to see more. And um, we'll dive hopefully more into 
podcast territory as well, as we're currently discussing with our colleagues from the Mediterranean uh, Sea Basin in the EU for Ocean Coalition, how a second season could focus on the Mediterranean. I will close here. That was probably too much uh, of information to process. But um, if you take anything away from this, we had a very lively uh, exchange with, with fantastic speakers and hopefully we're able to showcase a bit what the EU for Ocean platform does. You can still become part of it and become a member of it. We, I was in touch with one or two um, institutes who um, expressed interest who would like to join the platform and of course be in touch um, with our Youth for Ocean colleagues. And if you're interested in the podcast, you'll find If Oceans Could Speak on all major podcast platforms. Those were my three takeaway messages. Uh, I have to check that I didn't overextend uh, my own time slot that I set. And uh, I would like to hand over now to Mika, um, who has been instrumental in bringing together the teacher workshop. Mika is uh, working for the International Polar Foundation and was also moderating our teacher workshop on Tuesday afternoon. And Mika, it would be great if you could share your insights right now. Thank you very much, Arne, for this introduction. And thanks again uh, for inviting me um, to co-host the teacher workshop together with um, Evi Kopians from MC. And um, <clears throat> I'm trying to... Moved to, yes, so um, I co-hosted the teacher workshop together with Avi from uh, the European uh, Network of Blue Schools, um, and we also invited um, Dr. Lars de Montfort, who is um, a professor uh, in the University of Greenland. Um, just to speak, just to give a small uh, overview of the education workshop, we had like nearly forty teachers um, participating in the workshop, which was nice. They were spread over all of Europe. Um, of course, we had Lars as a participant from Greenland, um, and we had one person from Sweden. Uh, we had someone from Lithuania. We had two people from Portugal. We had people from Germany, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands. So I think uh, we had, and yeah, we had quite a, a broad spread over Europe, which, which really delights me. Um, most of the teachers were um, secondary school teachers teaching to uh, students of 16 years and older. Um, one third of them, well, yeah, one third was teaching in secondary schools to kids of 12 to, six, to 16 years. And then we had one primary teacher who was giving arts in, the, in a primary school, which is also very exciting, of course, that people from different backgrounds have been following the workshop. Um, to start with the workshop, we also did a little poll, of course, as Arne also pointed, it was not a scientific uh, uh, survey, but um, it was just nice to know uh, what these teachers associate, for instance, with the Arctic. So the first question we asked them was, what, what is just popping up in your mind when you think about the word Arctic? Um, most people have um, have pointed to the whale symbol and the ice crystal and the low temperature crystal, uh, low temperature uh, icon. But what was striking was that at least one person also <laughs> added a penguin and the Antarctic landmass. Um, so, uh, in terms of um, yeah. Or, or uh, Arctic literacy, as Arne also pointed to. Um, there is still work to do about um, yeah, getting to know the differences which are really um, huge between the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, some people have also clicked on land masses like Greenland um, and even uh, the US, the EU and China. Um, and what was striking was that nobody actually <clears throat> clicked on the Russian uh, land mass. So, um, it's it's just interesting to see how people from all over Europe have how they look at the Arctic without like before they have had any um, extra information on the Arctic. Um, we also asked them what uh, they find interesting uh, to teach about in, from the Arctic. So 
Arctic weather and climate change was coming up as the most um, popular topic. Um, also sea ice cover, which is of course related to weather and climate change and large mammals um, are also very attractive to teachers. Um, we also asked them what they find important in the educational resources that they are looking for, because um, from experience, I know that <clears throat> many, that there are teachers who, who like to create their own educational resources, at least in, in Belgium, that's the case. Um, but what came out of this poll was that most people find real reliability of the educational resources very important. So that's a um, thing to keep in mind. Um, they also have to be engaging um, and relevant or recent. So there, um, I, I totally, um, yeah, I can confirm the, the urge that Paul was um, giving in his uh, introduction that um, having uh, courses or lessons that are tailored to um, to actual uh, facts that are recent is also very valuable. Um, and to give a hopeful note, I have been for the IPF for the Polar Foundation. I have been giving a few workshops on the Arctic um, and actually on both polar, polar regions. And one of these workshops was in a primary school where they had a full uh, polar week. So the, the children were like, yeah, like the whole week they had been making um, games and, and drawings and everything on both the Arctic and Antarctic. So um, it is happening, Paul. Uh, it just needs, and it is very inspiring. The kids were extremely thankful when we visited them. They made drawings afterwards and so on. So there is, um, things are going in a good direction. Um, then I'll quickly point to our keynote speaker, Lars de Montfort, uh, who is teaching about permafrost, culture history, and ice, snow, and water in Greenland. And um, he came to, um, yeah, to, to point the audience to um, why the Arctic is so interesting for education in Europe and beyond. Um, he not only pointed to the Arctic Ocean, but also to the importance of, for instance, the Greenland ice sheet, because um, actually, and that's the big takeaway message of his um, talk was that you cannot disentangle the ocean from land, because what's happening on the Greenland on Greenland is having such a big impact on uh, the ocean that you really cannot teach about the ocean without telling students what's actually happening uh, with the ice cap. Um, he also gave some nice comparisons, for instance, um, the speed of the ice loss in Greenland. So you can see on this um, image, the speed of uh, the ice flow. Um, so the darker it gets, so the more blue it gets, the, more, the faster the ice is flowing towards the sea. Um, and he said, you could easily compare it with um, 2,500 elephants running into the ocean per second, per every minute, every hour, every day of every year, you get like 2,500 elephants uh, equivalent of ice volume running into the ocean. So that's quite impressive. Um, he also, and yeah, the reason why land is impacting so much uh, the ocean, it, he also pointed us to that, uh, that more and more glaciers are becoming, um, are not ending in the ocean anymore, but are ending on land. And this has a big um, impact on the primary, primary productivity, for instance, in the ocean um, with a lot of uh, feedback mechanisms. Um, he also uh, gave a little overview of the history and the cultural history of Greenland. And that's, uh, that was important to know because that pointed us to the lifestyle of, of the uh, indigenous peoples uh, near the coasts of Greenland. And yeah, you can also extend it to the other coasts, uh, coastlines of the Arctic. Um, because he, yeah, he, he showed us how dependent people are on, on natural resources. Um, and how this, uh, like the change in sea ice cover and changes in, in the ocean uh, primary productivity and um, food webs is going to dramatically change the lifestyles um, and, and yeah, threaten actually um, survival of, of people at the coast. Um, so this was a really interesting um, talk. 
giving us a viewpoint that was slightly different from the pure oceanic uh, talks, but it was again a very nice um, bridging of different worlds. Like we, we are trying to bridge the world of the Arctic with Europe, and he bridged the world of the ocean with land, and that was very um, inspiring. So then after his uh, presentation, um, I gave an overview on educational resources that are existing on the Arctic Ocean. Um, I started with pointing to a few interesting uh, big projects that have produced a lot of very interesting educational resources. I've um, shown them to the teachers, um, which I cannot do here, of course, because otherwise I would take up all the speaking time. Um, but I can say that I was very impressed uh, by, for instance, all the, the like more than 35 uh, educational resources in the Edu Arctic 2 project. Of course, also the mosaic um, expedition, uh, which Arna already pointed to. Um, and then there's a few organizations uh, that are very active in Arctic um, and also Antarctic uh, Education and Outreach, which is the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, Polar Educators International, um, the National Snow and Ice um, Data Center in the US also has tremendous educational resources. And of course, I couldn't forget the International Polar Foundation with, on, in which I'm working, uh, which is based in Brussels. Apart from projects and organizations, uh, I also pointed to DIY resources, um, even though the teachers uh, in this uh, workshop were less interested in the DIY uh, educational packages. Um, but there are some interesting lexicons, for, for instance, Polarpedia. Um, there's a big glossary in the N on the NSIDC website and in IPF itself has also smaller glossaries in different educational resources. Um, there are really beautiful, engaging, um, yeah, outreach um, elements like virtual science expeditions, um, also related to um, Edu Arctic 2. Um, they have like 360 degrees videos in which they give explanations. And while you are listening to the explanation, you can just choose to, to look around you on, on a 360 base. Um, viewpoint and it really feels like you are in you are there in the Arctic. It just needs to be a bit colder in the, in the room, and then you really feel like you're actually there. Um, then there's a lot of data and imagery that is um, freely available for people. You have the European Atlas of the Seas, which also has, of course, it's not covering the full Arctic, but at least the European part of it. Um, you have the uh, GBIF, the Global uh, Biodiversity Database, um, which of course also has um, Arctic um, data. Um, there's the National Snow and Ice Data Center, and um, I, it was also striking to know that there's a lot of uh, local and regional community-based projects that are also um, giving their data free. Um, and in terms of satellite, imagery, um, I showed the teachers that there is uh, the option of polar view and that also QGIS, QGIS is a, a free, free um, GIS program, um, which also has a specific Greenland package that people can freely download. Um, <clears throat> I already pointed to community-based environmental monitoring. Um, I found it very important to, to, um, to tell it to the teachers because um, at this moment, I see that there's still two lag legs. There's one leg focusing on environmental um, monitoring with local communities in the Arctic. And then there's um, citizen science projects that are most of the time global or focusing on tourists. Um, and as far as I understood from the literature, um, I see that these two legs haven't been connected very much or very intensively yet. So there's still some work to do there. So um, yeah, that's about an overview of the whole workshop. Um, and I think myself, I have learned a lot from it and um, the teachers afterwards were very happy to um, to receive all the links to all the projects. And it's, it's tremendous, like, a bit of feedback that I got from a professor from the University in Leuven was that like, 
I didn't know so many people were doing things on the Arctic. And I was like, yeah, yeah, um, indeed. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, it's very uh, motivating and it was very interesting to, uh, to be able to give this, uh, present this um, workshop as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mika, and also Evi, of course, uh, for that excellent workshop. I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, thank you also for, for the excellent overview. I think you know over 30 teachers uh, in there uh, with ranging from all across uh, the EU uh, really shows there is a need for um, a more information, but also more um, uh, information about where to find it, <laughs> that what already exists. And we'll talk about uh, sort of the idea of um, sharing that more widely uh, in a bit. But before we discuss uh, for the next steps, let me hand over to our third uh, speaker um, who will report back to us um, on the Youth for Ocean workshop. Um, I will just have two introductory remarks. Um, and I would thank, first of all, all the Youth for Ocean from colleagues and Youth Network colleagues um, who have been very active and engaging and reaching out and also share with the wider audience that unfortunately our workshop was uh, Zoom bombed, uh, as they say. So there was um, an intruder, if you will, who tried to um, block the workshop from uh, happening basically halfway into the workshop um, and spamming us with loud noise. And so uh, thanks to the uh, technical support staff, we were able to contain that and continue. We lost only a few minutes to that. But um, just to show that, um, you know, sometimes communication in, in the wider public is very difficult. And it's, it's difficult if, if people are trying to disturb um, to keep them out. But thanks again to all those who showed that resilience um, and sort of continued discussions afterwards and uh, still allowed us to have some takeaway sessions from that. So uh, let us not be silenced here, but uh, vice versa, um, have some echoing uh, and resounding welcome to Anna. Anna, please. Thank you so much, Arne. Indeed, uh, it has been a very interesting event, uh, although uh, we had a, a disruption, but I think that um, we have uh, a set of uh, takeaways that I can share with you today. So first of all, I wanted to introduce uh, very quickly um, what the Youth, Youth, for Ocean, Youth for Ocean Forum does. Uh, for those of you who were not present in the open ceremony. So we are uh, today an, a European uh, network uh, community of more than 200 young change makers uh, aged between 16 and 30 years old. Uh, we have very different backgrounds, but um, we have a common passion for the ocean and for ocean literacy. So because of that, we collaborate and we co-create uh, ocean literacy campaigns and uh, a set of uh, projects that are part of the EU for Ocean Coalition. And um, we also have a, a very important element in the Youth for Ocean Forum, which is the Young Ocean Advocate Program. Uh, it is, thanks to this program, it is possible for the members of the forum to really build capacity and realize and um, showcase their projects uh, on ocean literacy and ocean conservation more broadly. And it is possible for them to amplify, to multiply the positive impact of their project and of their action. So uh, it is very um, important to highlight this point. And uh, starting from there, I wanted to uh, say that we have very um, important inputs from the participants to the Young Ocean um, Advocate Program into the uh, Youth in the Arctic event. The Youth in the Arctic event indeed took place uh, on the 5th of April um, in the afternoon, uh, right after the uh, teachers workshop. And it was a networking event for young people, not only from the Youth for Ocean Forum, but also from other networks that are somehow connected to the Arctic Ocean um, to really come together and uh, understand where we stand with each other. And uh, most importantly, build momentum 
to find those uh, synergies and those complementarities among our projects and initiatives that can help us really uh, expand our work and keep collaborating and working together. So um, going through uh, what we discussed and also the presentations during the event, um, an important, uh, well, a first important lesson uh, that I learned and something that really struck me was that um, all of these presentations had a very creative, a very innovative element uh, that young people brought into uh, disseminating knowledge about the Arctic Ocean. And, uh, and therefore, I wanted to share with you a few, um, a few uh, words about each presentation. So um, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, the people that uh, participated and that made presentation and pitched their projects um, are not only uh, people from the Arctic, but also people that come from communities that, that do, not, um, do not belong to the, to the Arctic uh, region. But nonetheless, they shared a very inspiring project for that they are um, using to share knowledge with their communities and also to create impact and uh, raise awareness about the Arctic and its concerns, uh, environmental concerns um, beyond their communities. Uh, so the first one was uh, Katharina Heinrich from the Arctic Youth uh, Network Oceans Working Group uh, that share a presentation on ocean relevant topics from youth to youth. Katarina has uh, introduced her organization and uh, the activities they have, and especially um, the uh, sharing knowledge about the BBNJ, the high seas treaty process that is happening right now, and how the Arctic Youth Network is sharing and making accessible uh, to young people in the network and everywhere in the world, a series of, uh, um, uh, of uh, materials and, uh, and uh, information about how the process is, um, uh, about the BBNJ process. Uh, next was uh, Linda Brown from Students on Ice Foundation, um, which is a foundation leader in polar education around, around the world. Uh, she gave us an introduction of all of the amazing programs of the foundation that include Arctic learning resources, training, mentorships, but also all of the unique experiences such as the Arctic expeditions that are organized by the foundation uh, and are accessible for young people all over the world. Um, moreover, uh, we had the presentations of the Young Ocean Advocate uh, candidates, which uh, were truly insightful as well, um, such as the one from uh, Megan Bryce, who presented her project uh, under the poll, um, which um, is the uh, outcome of uh, the deep of uh, the deep diving experience. Uh, in the depths of the Arctic Ocean. Um, by deep diving and um, gathering information, but most importantly, um, taking pictures and videos of what is happening under sea ice and in the deep Arctic Ocean, uh, Megan and her team were able to, um, to, to gather this information and to share them with the young people all around France, and especially the ones from um, the landlocked areas or uh, that are very distant from, from the ocean. So it was uh, really interesting um, to, to, to think about this as well. Um, moreover, Sadie Blank, uh, Blankfloor, uh, another young ocean advocate, uh, presented the, the um, project Future Threads um, about climate displacement in the Arctic. Uh, which is communicating climate concerns in Arctic coastal communities through art, photography, and emotional connections. Uh, Incha Alieva um, had a project on art and social media communication campaigns that share knowledge about the Arctic regions and the Arctic Ocean, of course, and that are dedicated to her community in Azerbaijan. So the title of the presentation was also very evocative, uh, saying that what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. 
So um, in terms of what are our, our main takeaways and outcomes, I would say that, um, well, if the, the main uh, aim of this, um, of this event was to really uh, understand how we can keep collaborating, especially between EU non-Arctic and Arctic uh, communities of young people. Uh, something that I really understood and that we could all agree upon from our discussion is that networking events uh, like this, um, where there is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange and uh, where we share also our ideas and concerns is very, very useful to have and to bring together people from different, uh, from different communities, from different countries that are interested in the Arctic and that come from the Arctic. Um, so this is very, I think that the most uh, important uh, takeaway from this event. And also uh, a major takeaway when it comes to young generation, I think uh, is that in the chaos of our lives, of our current lives, and uh, the problems uh, that are uh, that are all over the world, and uh, uh, also in our eco anxiety, very often and in concerns about climate change and the changes in the Arctic, I think that it's important to find those moments to get together and exchange all of the actions that young people are uh, leading in the world and in the Arctic itself to really um, um, share our passion and uh, share among ourselves that we care and that there are other people that really care, care and uh, that are uh, really creative, uh, getting creative about um, sharing and raising awareness around the world about what is happening in the Arctic and what we can do to save the Arctic. So I think that these were the main takeaways. And um, yeah, another uh, last element, and I hope that it was, it's not too late, is that uh, it's important also to make use in the future of uh, the initiatives that already exist in the EU for Ocean Coalition and the tools that we already developed, such as the podcast, for example. Um, getting used to participate in these uh, initiatives and to exchange with uh, also the experts and the teachers in the coalition uh, would be a really, really um, insightful experience and uh, perhaps help also young people to um, again, multiply their impact and uh, share what we want for the future of the Arctic Ocean. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for the presentation and the insights into the exchanges. And I can only second that. It was great to, to see that peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer connection, as you said, uh, happening live and definitely there's room to, uh, to further uh, exchange. So um, with that, I would like to also invite Mika back to the stage and to discuss a bit with you, Mika and Anna, um, sort of having heard your lessons and takeaways from the individual workshops on Tuesday. Um, what, let's discuss a little bit how, what you think, how we can take things forward. And um, we'll also hear an international perspective uh, shortly and then also be very much open to um, the audience questions. Um, but maybe to, to kick us off, um, I think there are two takeaways. Um, you mentioned um, Mika, the, the fantastic overview you gave on the repositories and the feedback that you received. They didn't know that there was so much already going on. I think that is really a key takeaway for me. There is, There are these communities working uh, already from outside the Arctic, but of course, so much more knowledge in the Arctic. So how can we connect these spaces? I think that's the one key theme I would like to explore with you. And the second is, uh, Anna, you mentioned the peer-to-peer -peer exchange, and I want to pick that up. Um, sort of how can we get those involved um, with people of a similar understanding, similar level of education, similar mindset, and not always have, you know, just some you know, like me talking <laughs> to a camera and, and annoying people, 
but rather having people who actively work on these fascinating projects of art, of, of um, you know, deep diving, of, of sharing these insights directly. Um, so how can we get these two together? And um, yeah, I don't know who would like to, to, to have a look first. I mean, of course, there will be some crossover possibilities um, and we'll, we'll get to that, but um, maybe a first um, idea question to Mika and Anna would like to go first. Okay. Um, yeah, I can give uh, something back Please. on that uh, question, if that's all right with Anna. Um, so yeah, indeed. Um, I think one of one of the things um, that has been striking me was um, that many of the resources that are existing are not yet translated into local languages. That would be one first step to, to go for. Um, I, I really, um, well, I work in the International Polar Foundation since six months and the idea was to develop an educational, like a new educational um, yeah, line with, with lots of new educational materials, also mainly focusing not really mainly focusing on the Arctic, but um, since the Arctic is, is becoming more and more um, important in all senses, both geopolitic geopolitically and um, also just in terms of climate change, it's so, it's so important that you cannot um, remain silent about it. And um, when I discovered all these educational resources existing, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna be unemployed in a month because they exist already. <laughs> And but then, yeah, I see that um, some of them have been translated, for instance, in Polish uh, or in, in Finnish, um, but, but not in Portuguese or Flemish or French or whatever. So that's the first step to go for. And then, of course, there's the other part of um, connecting the um, local community projects in the Arctic with the um, projects that are, um, well, or yeah, with the people from mainland Europe. Um, I think that requires a bit more efforts than only translating resources or, yeah, another option could be of, of course, creating a central database pointing to all these resources um, with, with a good search function. Um, in terms of connecting the local community-based projects and the, um, yeah, the, uh, people from mainland Europe, um, I think much more uh, interaction needs, like, um, it would be good to, to get, to uh, create dialogues between um, educators from Europe and, for instance, um, the Arctic um, tourism industry, because the tourism industry is now, for instance, kind of jumping a little bit on citizen science projects. They are doing it both in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and it's not an unspoken subject because, um, yeah, there, there is a scientific paper, paper, I don't remember the name of the, of the first author, but it was uh, talking about, is it citizen science or is it PR citizen science? And that, that's a bit of a, um, a hot, yeah, it's, it's a subject that is under discussion, um, but it is, it is a discussion that needs to be held anyway. And I think that um, Finn Danielson, who has written this, uh, this, this little book that I showed also community-based um, monitoring in the Arctic, it gives a, an incredibly beautiful overview of community-based projects in the Arctic, not only in the European Arctic, but in yeah, the whole Arctic region. Yeah. Um, I think dialogues between the main stakeholders are first step to go. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mika. And uh, before I hand over to Anna, I can uh, only second that. So main takeaways is translation to widen uh, to different communities and language communities. Uh, and also, of course, the all important connection directly to the people living in the Arctic um, communities in the Arctic. And that, of course, requires a certain amount of effort from our side uh, to, to build trust, to show the added value to the people living there. Um, and that we're not um, sort of just coming there to, to um, you know, get research results and then 
uh, share them broadly, but also uh, benefits to, to people and communities in the Arctic. Right? And um, I think um, there are different ways also to link this to, to podcasts and, and to show some perspectives and provide these links and also share knowledge about these repositories uh, or these ideas of translations. Um, and, and just on, on one spot on the, on the podcast discussion was it's definitely also how can we um, make it more accessible? And you choosing English as a conversation language is one thing, but we also made transcripts to make sure that we at least can uh, easily, hopefully, then machine translate uh, the transcripts and the knowledge contained in the exchanges to a much broader audience. Um, we're a little bit behind on time. So before we uh, hand over to the international level, Anna, please, uh, your take on um, potential crossovers, and you mentioned already um, linking the youth also to podcasts, I think was one of the ideas that you mentioned, but maybe there's um, there's more you would like to explore, please. Yes, um, thank you, Anna. Uh, I think that I will connect my, uh, my reaction also to what Mika uh, said. And uh, first of all, definitely it's difficult to understand uh, from uh, um, mainland Europe, let's say, um, what exists um, in, in the Arctic and uh, what are the local projects that uh, are probably led by, by young people. And I'm sure that there are a lot of them and very often we are not aware of them. Um, I was not aware of most of the, of the projects that were presented during the, uh, the youth event. So definitely some mapping of these activities is necessary um, on, on both sides perhaps, but most importantly, yeah, some uh, mapping and also understanding how to fill those uh, also logistical gaps uh, that exist, uh, especially for remote uh, communities. And I think, yeah, this is one of the points that was also discussed during the youth event. Um, yes, we want to make networking events among uh, Arctic and non-Arctic uh, young people uh, passionate about the Arctic happening. But how do we fill those gaps for those young people that perhaps do not always have the access or are um, yeah, live in uh, remote communities? It's right. very difficult to um, to to reach out and uh, and uh, vice versa. So I think that one of the um, one of the elements that we need to work on is exactly this to map those uh, existing projects both from the national perhaps or, uh, or a community level and understand how to link them. Um, we also realize that there are some uh, synergies already among the projects um, that uh, some projects can be replicated in different countries, for example, uh, or that uh, there are projects that are more based on uh, creating knowledge and then uh, that, that they can be shared. So one thing that, for example, can happen through the Euphor Ocean Coalition, and I'm sure that this will happen in the future, is to um, showcase even more those projects that we are at least aware of uh, right now that are participating right. in the Youth Production Forum. And uh, yeah, really giving more visibility to that. And uh, like I was mentioning before, also through the podcast, for example, but with all other tools, also also the, sure. the teaching tools. Thank you very much, Anna. And um, I would like to introduce now um, um, uh, the fourth voice to, to the exchange and um, hand over to Anna uh, Vittoria Magalhães. Um, and um, um, I think it's, it's important to stress because we have discussed now also several times tapping into circumpolar exchange and the importance to tie into uh, ongoing work and initiatives. And uh, who better could be uh, situated to provide us with an overview than Anna, um, who's working with ocean, on ocean literacy with the UNESCO. And uh, it's my pleasure to um, hand over to Anna to give us a, a bit of an overview of what's going on in the international level and how this ties in. So what are additional initiatives that um, our uh, audience should be aware of and how they can become engaged? Thank you very much, Anna. 
Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ana Vitória. I work uh, as ocean literacy consultant for the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, well, I believe that most people present here in this workshop agree that the ocean, uh, as well as the Arctic, is fundamental to uh, human life, but also to all the forms of life in this planet. And uh, the ocean is also important for food systems, for climate regulation, many other aspects that influence people around the world uh, and shapes as well the, the heritage of many communities and is linked to the intangible practices as well indigenous knowledge as well in the Arctic. So as some of you know, uh, the United Nations declared uh, that this decade will be dedicated to the ocean with the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And the motto of the decade is to leave no one behind. So we include everyone all uh, in the process of uh, better understanding the ocean and its features. And this, of course, is completely connected uh, to ocean literacy uh, and considers as well the achievement of the Agenda 2030 and the inclusion uh, of all individuals as well sectors uh, of society. And it's interconnected uh, again to the three communities of action of the EU for Ocean Coalition. So in this sense, uh, ocean literacy is one fundamental tool for the EU for Ocean platform uh, because it's more than awareness. Uh, ocean literacy, uh, it's about empowerment uh, of organizations, of people, of local communities. It's the understanding of the ocean influence on you and your influence on the ocean. Uh, ocean literacy is also about strengthening capacity capacities and developing solutions uh, to local and international challenges, including the Arctic. Uh, and ocean literacy is about behavior change and changing our relationship with the ocean to a more respectful approach. Um, it is a tool that has been uh, uh, traditionally very used in the educational sector, but it's also evolving to an approach for society as a whole and can be adapted as well to the different uh, regions and sea basins. So the national school curriculum uh, today, and I think uh, Paul uh, mentioned this in the beginning of uh, his talk, worldwide, uh, the, the national curriculum still lack uh, ocean literacy related contents. And in some cases, the school curriculum, so the contents that is, uh, uh, children and students receive in school do not, even mend, uh, uh, do not even mention the word ocean or Arctic. So the European Commission has promoted a network of blue schools in, in the last years in order to bring the, the ocean to the classroom. And this process can support a better understanding of the ocean in the educational systems from uh, a young age. Uh, as you know, the Blue uh, Schools Network is also part of the EU for Ocean Coalition and aligned with that, UNESCO, uh, IOC UNESCO has also recently launched one publication called A New Blue Curriculum, a Toolkit for Policymakers, which also aims to, to strengthen uh, the Blue Curriculum across all member states uh, through a coordinated work with uh, um, education, educational policymakers, but also well-informed and trained teach, teachers on ocean literacy, and as well informed students that are aware uh, uh, of the ocean importance to humankind. So those uh, bottom-up and top-down uh, top approaches are needed to fill the gap on ocean contents uh, into school curriculum, and youth uh, in this process are fundamental as well. Uh, platforms such as the Youth for Ocean uh, Forum can as well facilitate this uh, process. So the young people are now uh, the ones that will follow uh, the ocean related careers in the future. They will be the, the next scientists, the next, next generation of ocean scientists, of ocean explorers, of ocean uh, professionals. And this, uh, of course, can be facilitated if uh, young people, science at a young age, have contact with a blue curriculum that increases the students' values, competences, skills, and also supports this uh, integrated connection with nature. So a blue curriculum will also support and better prepare the next generation of ocean stewards and ocean citizens, and increase young people's capacity to engage in uh, ocean topics, such as uh, the blue economy, but also conservation. Uh, so just in order to finalize my, my talk, one of the findings that come from the, this week sessions on the Euphrosian Presence in the regional forum 
uh, on sustainable development organized by UNESCO is the experience uh, of this coalition, is the experience of bringing uh, everyone together, all stakeholders, recognizing the different uh, regions, the specificities, and also the cultural context. And ocean literacy can as well be adapted to that. And obviously for doing this tremendous uh, work that we have uh, ahead in the next years of the decade, we need everyone on board. Uh, we need the stakeholders part of the Youth Ocean Platform. We need the blue schools. We need more and more schools involved. Uh, we need uh, the Youth Ocean Forum and the younger generations on board and also the public sector, the private sector organizations and many other stakeholders that somehow are interrelated uh, with the ocean and the topics that the coalition brings, which are food from the ocean, climate in the ocean, and a healthy ocean. Uh, and then in the next uh, few years uh, of the coalition as well, IOC, UNESCO will be in charge as well of promoting the coalition by supporting the implementation of ocean literacy and establish, uh, establishing synergies as well, uh, supporting the coalition visibility. So I would like to finally thank the Youth for Ocean Coalition members for inviting me here today uh, to contribute to the advancement of ocean literacy in the Arctic. I will also leave on the chat later a link to the ocean literacy portal in case uh, the audience is also interested to visit because it's a place where uh, many the different target groups can also find resources of ocean literacy. Uh, and I would like to remind uh, the people that are present here in this event to understand that it's possible as well to act as one ocean citizen, being even in a remote area because the ocean is influencing all of us and all the time. So ocean literacy is not only for those that live in the coastline or live also close to the ocean, but for people as well that live in remote regions or rural regions. Uh, and it's important for us as well to recognize that it's, it's necessary to have this important role uh, to play uh, in our knowledge areas uh, regarding this shift towards a sustainable ocean. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Anna, for uh, tying us in and also taking us on that journey uh, to see what's already ongoing on the international level. And indeed, I think there were already some questions uh, regarding uh, sort of uh, they could receive the recording and or presentations. Uh, so we'll make sure that you will hopefully have them accessible um, early next week. Um, and also if you're looking for additional materials and also additional uh, pictures from the exchanges, uh, you can also check out on Twitter, the hashtag um, um, listen to the Arctic, uh, which we used uh, to also uh, promote the different sessions and the material. So there will be some insights uh, and some slides already, uh, but to, for the full experience, uh, I have to uh, beg you for a bit of patience until we have all recordings, uh, etc., together next week. Um, but I'm sure we'll also use uh, Listen to the Arctic um, to promote that, so you'll hopefully uh, find it very easily. With that, um, I think we have um, seven or eight minutes before I uh, announce our two final uh, speakers for today. And I would like to give now the chance to the audience to ask a question. So we have time for one or two questions. And if, so if you want uh, to ask a question, please go to the website slido.com. Um, I think we can share that uh, right now. So either you go to the website in your browser uh, or on your phone, or you simply scan the QR code, uh, which is now on the screen. And um, if you go to the website, you just need to enter the hashtag Arctic event, and you will get to the uh, interface where you can type in your question. So we'll um, maybe wait a minute or two until first call, um, uh, participants have a question. Hopefully I answered already those uh, regarding the availability of um, the materials and the um, presentations. So those will be made available next week, but if you have any ideas or additional points you would like to raise to uh, Mika, Anna, or Anna, um, or Paul, of course, uh, please let us know, and I'll be happy to see what we can pick up in the short remaining time. Um, in the meanwhile, I think, indeed, um, I would like already maybe to give a brief overview on what's next uh, on the EU for Ocean Coalition, and also in terms of upcoming events. 
Um, we will uh, hear shortly um, from our uh, colleagues Spada Obaidula about the Make EU Blue campaign. So how you can actively contribute uh, also uh, as an individual and, and join our work on ocean literacy and promoting it. And then of course, we'll hear uh, the overview final remarks from uh, our DG Mare colleague, Andrea Strachinescu. Um, so then I will have actually uh, no time left to speak after those two. So I'll, I will take my, my chance already to thank everyone for um, a fascinating ride through Arctic Ocean Literacy the whole week. Thank all the participants, contributors, and um, those who were active in the exchange on all Tuesday activities. But there will be more coming up. So, um, for instance, um, a workshop that I um, we can share, it was going to take place already next week. It's going to be dedicated to the Arctic Ocean as well, and it's a Copernicus Marine training workshop. So there will be online sessions on April 12th and 13th, uh, giving some insight uh, and are specifically um, made uh, for also young researchers um, to get familiar with the availability of uh, satellite in situ and model products, how to use them. Uh, so 12th and 13th of April, um, if you go to the um, Copernicus website um, and their events page, you will find information on the um, marine training workshop for the Arctic Ocean um, quickly. That is coming up already next week. And in May, I'm excited to hopefully see uh, some or many of you uh, at the European Maritime Day, which is going to take place uh, on the May 19th and 20th in Ravenna in Italy. So there will also be a whole uh, day of, of the European Maritime Day where we'll share more um, about the EU for Oceans activities from the coalition, from the Youth for Ocean Forum and from um, the Blue Schools Network. There will be a booth, uh, we'll share uh, hopefully also more uh, about our podcast episodes and the developments uh, for a second season. So stay tuned. And if you happen to be in Ravenna or participate online in some of the events, um, please do get in touch. I think that's my, my advertising uh, spot right now. And maybe we can see if we have any questions from the audience that we can address in the next uh, three or four minutes. And I don't know, Claudia, can you let me know if there's questions already coming up? But maybe I've talked everyone already into getting hungry for lunch and uh, or early lunch and uh, we could be here. So maybe Claudia, can you, uh, or Sami, can you let me know if there have been questions coming in? No, no question yet. No questions? We've answered them all then. That is also good news. Um, so with that, I think um, I would, um, again, extend my thanks and also um, now uh, let you in the good hands of Farah Obaidullah, um, who will share also how you can actively contribute to the campaigns and share some insights on the, the work that has been ongoing on Make You Blue. Farah, uh, the word is yours. Thank you, Arne. I'm just waiting for my presentation to appear unless people can see that. I'm still seeing the Slido, uh, Slido um, slide. It's Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, so my name is uh, Farah Obaidila and I'm a campaign consultant for the Make EU a Blue campaign. I'm also the, the founder of Women for Oceans, which is a platform that promotes diversity in the ocean space um, to accelerate solutions. And also in particular, we focus on the efforts of, um, of women around the world. Um, so we've heard a lot of things this week, um, and perhaps you heard my talk on Tuesday, my appeal to all of you to help us make EU blue, uh, so I'll keep it short here, um, but just, just to say that, you know, uh, it, as we've heard from our speakers today, but also throughout the week, uh, the Arctic is, is uh, the place on Earth that's warming the fastest as a result of the climate crisis. Uh, we know that, um, that we live on a planet which is a blue planet, all the oceans are connected, so what happens in any part of the world 
affects all of us and it, it, it affects um, it, uh, the ocean wherever we are. So our actions here will affect what happens in the Arctic. Um, so when we uh, started thinking about how we can unify our efforts across Europe, um, how we can sort of bring everybody along in this journey to, to uh, you know, to, to achieve sustainable and healthy oceans. And as a speaker earlier uh, today just, well, just mentioned that, um, that uh, as part of the decade of ocean science, we should leave no one behind. Um, we were thinking, well, what, what can we do? We have a pandemic, we cannot meet in person, uh, but how can we bring everybody from the most remote parts of, of Europe and in fact uh, the world together uh, to help us uh, uh, make EU blue? And so we came up with this online uh, sort of campaign um, idea where uh, no action is, uh, you know, is too small to, to make a difference for the ocean. I'm just going to click to the next slide. There we go. Um, and so the idea is obviously to increase ocean literacy across Europe, but also to turn that literacy into action um, and to unify our efforts across Europe to send a strong signal to decision makers uh, within Europe, whether that's at the local municipal level, but also at the uh, at the institutional level in Brussels, but to show that the people of Europe, we're ready for action for the ocean, we're prepared to take action for the ocean, and we really want to see that action now happen uh, at the international and, and, and regional levels. Um, so to help empower people, this campaign uh, it allows you to inform yourself about the ocean, about what actions, uh, you know, what, what what is happening to our ocean? So we provide uh, bite-sized uh, uh, fact-checked information about the ocean, and then you can see what fits with 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 your life, with your with the uh, challenge that you can uh, that you can take on, the pledge that you can make uh, to help us make the EU uh, blue. Um, so these are just some examples of pledges that we have been uh, uh, seeing, but also sort of suggesting as, uh, as, as ones that might be achievable. Uh, they, they vary from abstaining uh, uh, from eating sustainable, uh, abstaining from eating seafood or choosing to eat sustainable seafood only, uh, but also reducing energy consumption. We've heard how important it is that we have to cur curb the climate crisis. We need to reduce our uh, our own carbon footprints, uh, but by doing that, we're also signaling very strongly that uh, we want this action to be taken regionally, as I said, uh, but also just small things like picking up trash on your walk or organizing in your community or supporting an NGO that you, uh, that, that you like, whether they're operating locally or internationally, um, and, and, and creating awareness. I've seen a lot of pledges about the, the people's ambition to create awareness, whether it's among their peers or among their uh, uh, communities. Um, and, and just to remember, these actions are not just for individuals, but they're also for businesses. This Make EU Blue campaign is also about mobilizing and uh, 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 inspiring businesses to take actions. For example, businesses can decide that on a, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that that they uh, uh, only supply sustainable seafood in their canteens or no seafood food at all, if that's possible. Uh, or for example, having policies around uh, waste management and, and the use of disposable plastics and, and banning those, for example, altogether. So there really is um, um, actually no limit to what individuals and companies can do to help us uh, uh, make the EU blue. Um, here are some pledges that, uh, that, that you know, have already been made. Uh, we've, we've been, this campaign has been active for almost a year now, and we've seen, uh, uh, I'll show you a map in a minute of, of, of how and, and where we're seeing those pledges uh, come in from. Um, but I, for example, made a pledge uh, as well, and I'll be reporting on progress on that uh, in, in the next few weeks. Uh, but my pledge is to produce a book that serves as a one-stop shop on uh, ocean issues and all the ways that we interact with the ocean. And, and this book is really sort of the um, a, a collection of, of chapters that have been written by ocean experts from around the world um, to really show the diversity of the people that are working around the world to uh, to achieve healthy oceans. But we've also had some high profile people uh, make pledges for the ocean, including uh, Commissioner Sinkovicius, uh, but also as you, we've heard Paul Rowe speak earlier today and he's made his pledge for the ocean as well. And so it really is, I'm sure that if you think about what you already do, you probably do a lot for the ocean as it is. 
but it's important that we sort of that we document that because that's the way we inspire other people to take action. We've talked a lot about mobilization and about inspiring others and ra raising awareness, but it, but it really begins with us, you know, sort of stating what we do or what we aim to do, and that way we can uh, inspire others uh, in our uh, communities to do the same. You know, so here you have a little bit of an overview of what people are already, uh, or what pledges, uh, what the distribution of pledges is, I should say. Um, and what we want to see is we want to see this map turn blue. And as I said, it's uh, what we do anywhere in the world affects what happens in the ocean. It is one ocean. And uh, uh, right now we know the urgency of, the, of what's happening through the climate crisis is impacting the Arctic and, and, and well, both poles the most. Um, so it really is important that we understand and, 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 and make that connection. Um, on the screen, you'll see a QR code. Uh, if you uh, scan that code, you will come to the, to the page where you can make a pledge for the ocean, where you can learn about the ocean. As I said, uh, facts uh, checked, uh, bite-sized uh, information about the ocean. Uh, please find something that you can do and, uh, and make that pledge for the ocean. We've seen since I gave this talk on Tuesday or presented at the Make You Blue campaign, we've seen pledges come in and that's fantastic. Again, mostly around raising awareness and about sort of picking up plastics and, 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 and volunteering for organizations. But, um, and, that's, and that's great. And if you have other ideas for what we can do, please uh, you know, submit those. Um, because not everybody can do everything, so we need to, to, to be able to uh, showcase and present a, a, a broad range of ideas that we all can get on board and really uh, uh, send that strong signal to decision makers that the time for action has come um, and gone, actually, but we need to be doing it now. Um, and yeah, so this is our tool for empowering you. Um, and that is Thank it. You so much. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, then please feel free to send me a note. Thank you so much, Farah, for providing that overview and also reminding us to, to pledge. Um, I, I also did that, and indeed, it's also um, already um, an important exercise to reflect on your own actions um, when pledging and to see how you can continue to contribute, but also um, deepen your efforts um, to work towards this. So. With this, thank you so much, Farah. Uh, I'm sure we'll receive many more pledges to make that map blue indeed. And um, it's my honor uh, to hand over to our last speaker for today and also for this week of Arctic Ocean Literacy, uh, Andrea Strachinescu from DJ Mare. I'm very grateful for their support uh, to the project and to the EU for Ocean Coalition. So they have been the ones who made all of this possible. And it's great to have you, Andrea. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I would like to say congratulations to all of you for all the interesting uh, debates that uh, happen uh, uh, during this, uh, these days. I'm certain that um, uh, you are living with, uh, with a baggage full of uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, seeing how we can work together uh, in the future. It's quite important that uh, we are considering that we need uh, to, uh, to pursue for sure the work on social literacy in, in Europe. And this was the idea from the beginning that uh, we want to gather all the relevant stakeholders. We want to create the coalition in order to allow uh, everybody to be informed, but also to be able to make a contribution. It's about efficiency, it's about impact, it's about more efficiency for the common work, and also seeing what can be the useful insights into policy, future policy de development. There were uh, interesting things that were presented uh, during the, the days. And if you are looking a little bit what we should take and see how we are working to the future, we heard quite a lot about the value of the Arctic and of the people living there, but also uh, about the knowledge of indigenous people. And uh, for sure, there is a need to share this in a wider way. Uh, and here we are speaking, the audience are not, that are not the, non, the uh, Arctic ones. So to go to down, towards the non-Arctic audience. And uh, this is probably something that the coalition could work into the future in order to allow to make the Arctic Ocean more prominent in the, in the ocean literacy. 
as well there were uh, great examples like the podcast uh, as a way to have uh, a bigger impact to be able to go to wider audience but also to stimulate engagement and uh, this uh, uh, can be seen of course how can we develop towards other tools maybe uh, apps maybe some other things that can be used in order to uh, be used to promote the uh, ocean literacy and uh, it comes uh, that at the end we need of course to give more visibility of the work that we are doing, especially in the digital age in which we are uh, we are creating this. So visibility, impact, it's really something extremely important. And uh, we heard as well about interesting uh, principles in terms of teaching ocean literacy in schools. We know that there is already a handbook, handbook sorry, of practices that on which we can, we can build. Uh, we need, of course, to have more materials, more tools to act uh, uh, as a basis for any teacher who uh, provide uh, uh, the knowledge in the classroom, uh, all the teachers that are interested uh, to, uh, to disseminate, I would say, about the ocean and uh, to, uh, to, to facilitate the, the understanding of the, of the kids about, uh, about the ocean, to sensibilize them towards the uh, ocean uh, values. So all of this, of course, uh, all this material, uh, especially for the teachers, needs to be found in one single place, need to be accessible, needs to be uh, engaging. So this is probably another way that coalition should look and consider in the work for, for the future. And uh, developing maybe a big library that can be used for ocean literacy uh, teaching. And finally, when it comes to the youth uh, engagement, uh, we heard from the Youth for Ocean Forum, uh, we heard that uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm. Uh, we need, of course, to continue working on this and to bring all the existing initiatives under uh, one umbrella in order to allow them to uh, deeper uh, engage uh, and to stream their, their future uh, work. Probably having isolated networks will not create progress. So the idea is how we bring everybody in dialogue, how we allow the exchanges in order to stimulate, uh, I would say, uh, the paths on which we can go for, uh, for the future. So um, maybe this shows a little bit uh, in terms of what we need also as well to, to work. So the need to create more synergies. Uh, and to, of course, to avoid the, uh, the overlaps. So um, if I'm to, to conclude on this, um, is that if we look at this particular uh, region uh, that um, uh, was addressed, we can conclude, all of us, that Arctic plays an important role in the European Green Deal, and it's linked to all the policy objectives we have in terms of climate, we have in terms of economy, we have in terms of decarbonization. And we need to do more, I would say, on the arting, and we need to involve more the active in all the ocean literacy uh, effort. Uh, we have as well, uh, Arctic is prominent, I would say, in other part of the work that we are doing. And here I would like to mention the Mission Ocean of Horizon Europe. We have a lighthouse bringing together the Arctic and the Atlantic and mission, uh, uh, missions in Horizon Europe are strongly linked to the citizen engagement and they have an important part related to education. So I think it's extremely important as well that all the efforts that are made to the coalition to see how they are feeding all the initiatives that are going to be developed uh, do, um, to be developed within the mission. It's quite important to, uh, to build, I would say, uh, bridges. And uh, the projects in Horizon Europe having uh, asking citizen engagement, of course, that would be good practices that can contribute to, to this. And again, of course, with the purpose, not only to bring value, but to try to build more and to avoid the overlaps. So, um, Congratulations to all the participants. Congratulations to the organizers. And uh, this is only the, the beginning of the path and uh, let's work together and uh, really um, 
make ocean literacy, uh, I would say, uh, give the ocean literacy the broad European Union value, contributing and engaging all regions, including Arctic. So thank you very much. And uh, see you with uh, the next occasion. European Maritime Day was mentioned. So 20th of, uh, of uh, May in Ravenna, Italy. Uh, very happy to, to meet several of the ones uh, presented here today. And uh, yeah, the journey will continue. Ocean literacy is not going to stop in Ravenna, for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea, for giving us the overarching framework and, and your assessment. And I couldn't agree more. It's about visibility of digital in the digital age. It's about uh, building those bridges and connecting those uh, platforms. So thank you so much for tying the event together. And um, so just with the last uh, words for today and apologies for the five minutes that we went overboard. Um, thanks to all the contributors. Also, big thanks to the technical support team that have been um, has been working tirelessly to make this uh, event a success. And um, for all of you and uh, the uh, participants uh, channel, um, please uh, again check out Make EU Blue. See what you can contribute yourself. Um, check out uh, Listen to the Arctic, the hashtag to see also the uh, recordings and. Um, uh, presentations being promoted uh, sometime next week and also of course uh, join the Copernicus workshop and hope to see some of you in Ravenna. Um, I think that's all there is uh, to say from my end. Um, best wishes from Berlin, stay safe and uh, have a wonderful weekend ahead hopefully. Take care and thank you so much for listening to the Arctic.